coach Don Shula brought his Miami Dolphins to historic Harvard Stadium to open the season against the Boston Patriots. An impressive team during preseason play, the Dolphins charged through the Patriots the first time they had control of the ball. Jim Kick carried a short flare pass from quarterback Bob Greasy, 47 yards to the Boston 15. Three plays later, Greasy followed guard Maxie Williams, number 78, around right in and sneaked into the end zone for the game's first score. In the second period, Miami's defense opened the way for a second touchdown when safety Jake Scott, a rookie from Georgia, intercepted a Patriot pass and returned it to the Boston 40. Greasy flipped out to rough running Jim Kick again, and the Dolphins moved to the Patriot 25. Kick, a stocky three-year veteran from Wyoming, powered across for Miami's second touchdown. And midway through the second quarter, the Dolphins held a commanding 14-3 lead. Quarterback Mike Tolliver pitched a perfect strike to Ron Sellers for the clinching score as underdog Boston surprised the Dolphins 27-14 and spoiled Don Shula's debut as head coach. In Houston's spacious Astrodome, there were grumblings to be heard instead of rumbling. And the grumbling came from Oiler quarterback Charlie Johnson, number 12, who had a right to be upset by the way the Miami Dolphins' defense was treating him. Led by number 75, Manny Fernandez, the Miami quarterback crushers caused problems for Johnson all afternoon. When they didn't physically get to him, they forced him to rush his passes. Then, when he was able to complete a pass, the hard-hitting Dolphins came up the winners. Perhaps it was the glare from the Astrodome ceiling, or perhaps it was the wizardry of Miami's quarterback Bob Greasy that kept the Oilers confused. At any rate, Greasy scrambled recklessly, used his blockers well, and made himself generally obnoxious to the Oilers. His second period pass to rookie Jim Mandich, number 88, gave the Dolphins a lead they never relinquished. In the third period, it was greasy to number 81, Howard Twilley, and Miami led 17-3. The Oilers finally got themselves together, and behind the receiving and running of tight end Alvin Reed, number 89, they seemed determined not to become the victims of an upset. When number 32, running back Hoyle Granger, took over the chores, he finally managed to crash in for a touchdown. But it wasn't enough, as the Miami Dolphins served notice that when they put it all together, they're going to be tough. 
After losing to Boston, the Miami win streak began in Houston, where the Oilers' Charlie Johnson was first to notice the Dolphins' improvement. A rugged defense and a ball control offense were Don Shula's two main goals. Both were apparent. And touchdowns by rookie Jim Mandich and Howard Twilley gave Miami a 20 to 10 victory. The Oakland Raiders have been a pro football power for several years, but so far this season they seem to have lost the touch. In Miami, the trend continued as this sprint by number 23, Charlie Smith, was nullified by a penalty. The Oakland attack was derailed by an aggressive Dolphin defense that hauled the Raiders in crucial situations. Number 12, Bob Greasy, is rapidly becoming known as one of pro football's great young quarterbacks. Greasy has found a new playmate this year in number 42 wide receiver Paul Warfield, acquired from Cleveland. Warfield showed that his speed and moves worked just as well in Miami as they did in Cleveland. Warfield was on the receiving end of two touchdown passes to hoist Miami to a 20-6 lead. In rainy Miami, Oakland bested the Dolphins in many statistical categories, but lost out on the most important one, the final score. The exciting running of number 13, Rod Sherman, and the determination of number 81, Warren Wells, were two of the few encouraging signs that showed up in Miami. The Raiders tried to move the ball any way possible, and number 81, Warren Wells, usually had a hand in the action. Wells attempted to reverse the Raiders' losing ways with a daring end around play. His one-handed grab of a Daryl LaMonica pass gave the Raiders their only touchdown. The 20-13 Miami victory cast the Dolphins in a role they've not been used to in previous years, the role of a winner. And it put Oakland in a role they too are unfamiliar with, the role of a loser. Although a victory over Houston was impressive, the Dolphins' first big test came against Oakland, a team Miami had never beaten. Despite a near hurricane, the Dolphins' young defense wiped out Oakland's renowned offense. In spite of the slippery field, Bob Greasy and Paul Warfield flashed early evidence of their big play potential. By himself, Warfield is a potent weapon. But paired with Bob Greasy, the combination is unstoppable. For the first time in their history, Miami beat the Raiders as they ran head-on into the New York Jets. Last Saturday night in New York, Baltimore's former coach, Don Shula, led his Miami Dolphins to a first-place tie with the Colts. The main ingredient in Miami's three wins has been the new passing combination of Bob Greasy to number 42, Paul Warfield, a receiver who leaves defenders stumbling after him. In all, Greasy connected with Warfield five times for 122 yards.
Miami's first touchdown came as Greasy sprinted left and found who else but Paul Warfield in the end zone. Greasy also passed for a touchdown to his other wide receiver, number 81, Howard Twilley. Joe Namath was there too, and so were a few of his old favorites, like number 87, tight end Pete Lamons, who battled for every possible yard. Another Namath favorite was there, number 32, Emerson Boozer, and he too gave it all he had. But conference leading rusher Matt Snell was gone. In his place was number 34, an experienced Lee White. No Matt Snell, at least not yet. And there were others missing, Jerry Philbin, Roger Finney, and in Don Maynard's place, several rookie receivers whose inexperience had to make a difference to Namath, who threw 40 times, mostly short ones, but connected only 17 times. And the Jets never did cross Miami's goal line. New York's power was nullified. George Sauer did not catch one pass, though he came closer to a touchdown than any other member of the Jets. Three times Namath was intercepted by the alert Dolphin defense. Once by rookie safety Jake Scott, number 13. Namath's last drive was sealed off by Dolphin cornerback Lloyd Mumford, number 26. The Dolphins had won 20 to six for their third win in four games. The Jets had lost their third in four games and for the Jets, the roughest part of their schedule is yet to come. Jets. Another team the Dolphins had never beaten in their five-year existence. But the spell the Jets had cast ended because this was 1970, and these were the new-look Dolphins. Once more, it was the combination of Greasy to Warfield that caused the real damage. Warfield left defenders stumbling in his wake as he slithered in and out of the Jets' secondary. When Greasy and Warfield had completed their magic act, the result was a 20-6 Miami victory. Broadway Joe and the Jets had been the third opponent to discover that the former doormats from Miami had become contenders. In Buffalo's War Memorial Stadium, the revitalized Miami Dolphins continued their steady rise to power under the rule of their new coach, Don Shula. The Dolphins scored first. Quarterback Bob Greasy combined a brisk passing attack with the bull-like charges of number 39, Larry Zonka, to give Miami an early lead. In the second quarter, the Dolphin defense, spearheaded by tackle Manny Fernandez, number 75, stopped the Bills' offense and set up two field goals by Garo Yaprimian. It seemed that Miami was on its way to an easy win, but Butch Bird intercepted a pass by Greasy and instilled a new confidence in the Bills.
Dennis Shaw, Buffalo's rookie quarterback from San Diego State, passed to his 250-pound running back, Wayne Patrick, who ran to the Miami 24. Shaw fired to Marlon Briscoe for a touchdown, and Miami only led by six points at the half. In the third period, Bob Greasy turned to his workhorse fullback, Larry Zonka, and the Miami Mauler personally accounted for 44 yards and another touchdown. Dennis Shaw answered Zonka's bludgeoning tactics with a crisp, precise passing game that ripped through the Dolphin defense for steady gains. Shaw completed 24 of 32 for 338 yards and two touchdowns. Marlon Briscoe, number 86, was on the receiving end of both scores. Shaw's second touchdown pass put Buffalo in winning range, but Dick Anderson snuffed out any chances for a Buffalo victory when he intercepted a pass by Shaw in the final period. Gracie and Warfield team for a touchdown, and your premium added two more field goals to ensure a Dolphin victory and a share of first place in the AFC East. In Buffalo, the Dolphins won their fourth straight, 33 to 14. Although the offense had received most of the publicity, a shored up defense had been the backbone of all the victories. Number 40, Dick Anderson, led a stingy secondary that often gave Miami good scoring position. And when you have a pair like Greasy to Warfield, that's the ball game. Paul Warfield had become all Miami had hoped for. In Philadelphia, the Dolphins hit bottom as they fell before the lowly Eagles, 24 to 17. The once powerful passing game had become anemic and ineffective. The cohesive team effort that had marked the first four victories was mysteriously absent. It was a time of frustration and confusion, a time when no one was sure what was happening. In Miami, there were rumblings of mutiny over Don Shula's refusal to replace Bob Greasy at quarterback. But Lloyd Mumford muffled the mumbling for a while as he raced 32 yards with St. quarterback Billy Kilmer's first pass and a 7-0 Miami lead. On Kilmer's second pass, he was more fortunate as he hooked up with one of his own teammates, Al Dodd, who recovered his own fumble as the brakes evened out. The play set up a tying touchdown on Tom Barrington's 11-yard bolt. The Saints got another break on the following kickoff, as Mercury Morris committed the first of four Miami fumbles. This one right into Dodd's fumble magnet hand.
But when wide open Ray Pogue caught a case of dropsy, the Saints settled for a field goal and a 10 to seven lead. Gracie then set out to silence his critics. Three times he would drive the Dolphins into scoring range and three times fumbles would halt the drives. A fourth time, a fence would be the stopper. A circus catch by Willie Richardson was wiped out when he was ruled out of the end zone. In the second half, Greasy's generalship began to pay off. A 42-yard strike to Paul Warfield set up a one-yard plunge by Jimmy Kick. Then Kick played hide-and-seek with number 77, Doug Cruzan, before streaking 56 yards. The run set up a six-yard rumble by Larry Zaka for Miami's final points, as Bob Greasy came back to lead the Dolphins to a 21-10 victory. In the ninth game of the season against New Orleans, the winning spirit returned. It was there in the determined effort of Willie Richardson. It was there in the renewed vigor of a defensive back like Lloyd Mumford, number 26. And it was there in the clutch receiving of a versatile back like Jim Kick, number 21. The winning spirit, the effort, the determination, but particularly the pride that had marked the Dolphins' win streak had suddenly reappeared. Miami rolled over the Saints 21 to 10, but the most important occurrence was the return to form of Bob Greasy. Greasy hit on 15 of 19 passes and was named the NFL's back of the week. An AFC Eastern Division game was played in more pleasant weather. The temperature in Miami was 70 degrees higher than in Minnesota as the first place Colts met the second place Dolphins with coach Don Shula seeking revenge. The Colts started as impressively as they had in the team's first meeting, a 35-0 Baltimore win. Jim Duncan took the opening kickoff 57 yards to set up a field goal. The Colts defense continued their onslaught on Bob Greasy, just as it had three weeks before. Then came the play that turned the momentum around. Jake Scott raced 77 yards with a punt to start the ball rolling. Bob Greasy rolled it a little farther when he went 15 yards on a quarterback draw. And Paul Warfield rolled it farther yet on a 27-yard touchdown pass reception to put Miami in front 21-3. But Johnny Unitas wasn't finished, and his passes began hitting their mark. Mm -hmm. 
Unitas threw two touchdown passes as the Colts fought back. One was on a four-yard flip to Roy Jefferson, and the other was a two-yard pop to Tom Mitchell. Miami's clinching touchdown came on a 51-yard catch and run, greasy to Carl Noonan. Despite the loss, the Colts held on to first place. But Shula's Dolphins had beaten his ex-pupils 34-17 in the rematch with a clutch game that kept Miami in the postseason playoff picture. Miami's sixth victory took place in Atlanta before a national television audience. All season long, the kick returning of number 13, Jake Scott, and Mercury Morris had been instrumental in giving the Dolphins strategic field position. From there, the bull backfield of number 39, Larry Zonka and Jim Kick took over. This formula resulted in a 20-7 Miami victory. Power is their password, touchdowns their result. In Miami, there is a new breed of fan. The phenomenal success of the Dolphins has brought out the night people to see the day people play football. And both groups look astonishingly alike. Against the Boston Patriots, Miami scored on the opening kickoff when Mercury Morris rocketed to a touchdown. Mercury not only traveled 97 yards, but revved up and recorded the most prodigious spike in the NFL this year. It was an easy day for the Miami offense. The Dolphins specialty teams recorded their second touchdown when Lloyd Mumford sprinted 41 yards with a blocked field goal. The Patriots enjoyed a few memorable moments. Number 30, Carl Garrett, the AFL's Rookie of the Year in 1969, showed considerable persistence against the tough-hitting Dolphins. Against Miami, the Patriots scored more points than they have in the last nine weeks. Number 35, Jim Nance, scored the first of three Patriot touchdowns then Carl Garrett persisted again on a short smash. Boston scored a third touchdown through the air as Mike Tolliver hit Gail Kniff at the end line. But for most of the day, the Patriot quarterbacks felt the punishing wrath of the Miami front four. With each passing week, number 11, Joe Cap adds one more bruise to his battered body. Against Miami, Cap's head received equal time for number 75, Manny Fernandez. When Patriot quarterbacks were not harassed by the Miami rush, their receivers were completely blanketed by the young Dolphin secondary. While the Dolphin defense was brutal and often spectacular, the Miami offense, led by setbacks Jim Kick and Larry Zonka, was bruisingly efficient. Zonka's power running meted out a heavy toll on Patriot tacklers, and Kick, as gifted a receiver as he is a runner, consistently split the Patriot zones on deep swing routes.
Quarterback Bob Greasy passed sparingly, but when he did, he received artful assistance from receivers like Howard Twilley, number 81. When Twilley turned cornerback Randy Beverly, number 27, completely around on a post-corner pattern, he was rewarded with a touchdown. Miami was rewarded with a 37-20 victory and almost a sure chance to reach the AFC playoffs. And maybe, just maybe, a chance to smile in the Super Bowl. The New York Jets flew into Miami intent on avenging an early season defeat. But Super Bowl thoughts already had started to enter the Dolphins' minds. Number 81, Howard Twilley, another original Dolphin, provided some clutch receiving. And with a playoff berth in mind, Miami decided to polish up a few new maneuvers. But old familiar tactics worked just as well. And another strong defensive effort, combined with three Garo Yapremian field goals, gave Miami a 16 to 10 victory. In previous years, Miami had never beaten New York. In 1970, they did it twice. All that stood between the Dolphins and the playoffs was a battle with the troublesome Buffalo Bills. Miami coach Don Shula needed a victory over the Buffalo Bills to clinch the fourth playoff berth in the AFC. And quarterback Bob Greasy was the one best equipped to deliver this victory. He was greatly helped by the Miami defense, which completely stifled Buffalo and spoiled their thoughts of playing the role of a spoiler. Dennis Shaw was persistently battered and the Buffalo offense was unable to effectively move the ball. Number 21, Jim Kick, set a Dolphin record by scoring three touchdowns, all capping methodical and well-executed Miami drives. The Miami offense played almost flawlessly and left no question that Don Shula has worked a miracle with a team that had the worst record in the AFL in 1969, winning only three games. Number 39, Larry Zonka's catch and short touchdown run helped give the Dolphins a 31-0 halftime lead. Greasy threw only 10 passes, but he completed seven of them. One, a 21-yard shot to Howard Twilley. Reserve quarterback John Stofa, number five, got his chance to perform in the fourth quarter, and he promptly hit Stan Mitchell with a 36-yard pass that gave the Dolphins a highly convincing 45-7 win over the stumbling Bills. Miami's most lopsided win in their five-year history, and with a final record of 10-4, and four, their best year ever. At game's end, Buffalo coach John Rouch could only look forward to a long winter, while Don Shula had thoughts of a sky-high team with sky-high hopes. Over 70,000 fans jammed the Orange Bowl to watch Miami's quest for its 10th regular season victory and a slot in the AFC playoffs. Jim Kick slammed over for three touchdowns as the Dolphins racked up their highest point total in history en route to their sixth straight win. The 45 to seven win gave Miami a 10 and four record, the best of any second place team in the conference and sent the Dolphins into the playoffs. The victory capped a season full of achievement for the Dolphins. Although they lost in the playoffs, Miami had seen the development of a winning tradition that was felt by everyone. 